this is really the excitement, exciting part, because this is what where the rubber meets the road. This is where people get healthy and happy and want to do this job forever. So forehand practice. Reduce the range of motion and throw the belly bar. I'm sure that there are a lot of people in this program that are gasping at the moment and are sure that that must be wrong. You don't have to, but you should. I guess is the best way for me to say it. You ought to do this. We'll show you how. So the second thing is there's time for two hands. Much of the productivity that is lost in clinical practice is actually due to the fact that once you've got things spread all over the room, as soon as the assistant leaves the room, you know, we ask the doctor, well, what happens? No, nothing. Because they can't reach everything. And so what they don't realize is once they leave the room and they go like, make a temporary, well, the stuff's all over the place. They, and they go like, oh, I'm more efficient at making a temporary. Yeah, you make it with four hands and then you're asking the system to make it with two, reaching all over the room. So if you have to walk, it's too far off. And then if you created a truly great forehand solution that converts to two, it should convert left, right seamlessly. Anything less than that isn't good enough. So I touched upon this before. There's really only two ways to create a productive treatment room. One is to go ahead and consolidate, as you see on the right, everything at the fingertips of both the doctor and the assistant. And the other way is to go ahead and split some of the supplies to over the patient, which you're probably more familiar with. Neither of those is more productive. Assuming that you get all of the supplies in the combined location. I'm just suggesting that we can treat more apprehensive patients and that it's a lot less expensive if you consolidate it all into one position. And in repeated studies that we've done, doing that is more productive than any other solution. So a question about that belly bar. Once we consolidate everything, what becomes possible, it's possible to eliminate that how did a belly bar come to be anyway? Are we so clever that we invented something that like no other industry has? Well, I, I got two, maybe trapeze artists, but window washer, you hang off a hook. Okay, rescue, helicopter rescue for the Coast Guard, you hang off a hook. Other than that, I, I think that they've got pretty extenuating circumstances that they need the hook. I don't really think it was genius for us to do that. So take a look here, and it's like, why does the hook exist? What happened that created that? It's very straightforward. Once we got more and more procedures, we spread more and more stuff around the room. Once we spread more and more around the room, it became essential that we could go ahead and figure out how to get over to that other stuff and then when we had to tip back to the patient that we didn't wind up falling on our heads. That was the essence of the problem here. And so the hook is just to prevent Roz in this situation from falling into the patient's lap because she's got to sit too far away to be able to obtain all the supplies. When Roz now moves into the doctor position to make the temporary, half of the stuff that she could ideally have access to, she doesn't have access to anymore. And the result of that too often is horrible posture and wanting to have another job. And that's what we're trying to prevent for you here. I want your staff members two things. One is that's not four-handed dentistry. That's really three-handed dentistry. One arm is hanging onto the hook and the other arm is kind of useful for sucking spit. I want to be able to pay people more, but if I am paying people more, I need to have them more productive. And so I need them closer to the field. And as they, as they get closer, they can go ahead and get rid of the belly bar and have a better posture. So let's take a look. 
Now Amanda in this situation, who's the assistant, is almost six feet tall. So she's actually at a little bit of a disadvantage con compared to a more traditional assistant. So you can see her tipping a little bit. I'd like to see her actually a little further in, in this situation. But you can see that the doctor is able to continue to produce seamlessly because the assistant never needs to leave the field to go ahead and obtain whatever supplies are necessary to go ahead and do of the practice. So let's take another look at this in the modern era. You know, we've had increasing concern for infection and infection risk in practice. And I believe, you know, if you think back, there was a time, yuck, when we didn't wear gloves. There was a time, yuck, when we didn't wear masks and it was normal and there were dentists that were very hacked off. There were dentists that were really hacked off when we had to go ahead and don these as universal precautions. Well, I believe that there will be a new level of universal precaution coming. And so uh, if you think about the aerosol that we produce, we're, we're the most exposed profession of any major profession to, to infection. Down in the lower left-hand corner, there's forestry people. So foresters don't get exposed much. Dentists are constantly exposed by a plume of aerosol. And it's not just generated by the hand pieces. It's these patients just plain breathing at us. And so I would like you to go ahead and ponder a simple and effective solution for the health and future of dentistry, which is what we've been working on this year. That's the safety shield. It operates on a track. It creates negative airflow as required by the Department of Defense in the US and the Indian Health Service. And simultaneously is a 100% barrier for splatter and at least 95% effective to absorb aerosols where it can be HEPA filtered or exhausted uh, straight out of, of, your, of your office. Well, let's talk about two hands. Because again, I, the excitement is once you get grade four hand, getting the two hand in practice becomes much easier. So if it's there, it's in a warehouse. And when we go and observe practices, too often, this is what we see. I know this is seconds of your life going away, which you can't ever get back. But they do this all day, every day, apparently. I mean, I don't know what the dentist is doing at the moment, staring at a tooth. I mean, the dentist is doing nothing, right? You know, oh, this is a beautiful crown prep I did. I'm amazed. I'm just admiring this crown prep. Look at it. He's got his mirror. He's like, oh, yeah, okay, great. Like, I've done 40,000 crown preps or something. I don't know what the, the number is an astounding number for being an old guy. And, like, I don't need to go ahead and admire my next crown prep. I need to get it done. And so the only amount of work, if you measure the amount of work that was done, there's about 10 seconds of work in all of that time. So you need to go ahead and make an efficient forehand setup and it needs to be able to convert immediately to two hand. So instantaneously, and this is where so many of the setups that we see fail because they can't bring the supplies with the setup to the individual. They can bring maybe a, a tray, but you need the materials as well for the two hand use. And then if you can do that, you should be able to slide that device, whatever, however you use it, to the left hand side. Uh, so this is a, a dentist that came in and helped me out uh, many years ago. I was lecturing in Atlanta. I didn't think it was that bad a lecture, but I went to get a burger across the street. I got mugged. Somebody was actually trying to steal this watch. Uh, they were like not good thief, but good mugger. And I tore my acromion, fractured the acromion, tore my rotator cuff and the biceps tendon. And uh, so we asked this guy to come in. He had been working for 30 years and it took him... Uh, 20 minutes to convert from right to left in the room. We worked with the right-hand dentist. They would Every day they would switch it over and switch it back. Um, and so the dentist came in and said, well, how do I convert to left-hand? We went, he went, I just spent 30 years doing that, having that be difficult. So it should be simple to go ahead and make that conversion. 
I was back in practice, by the way, in three and a half weeks. Because the range of motion is so small in practicing this way, my range of motion to be able to get back in practice needed only to be this. I mean, I couldn't do this for a long time, but I didn't need to do this. I, so, so there's a lot of wonderful things that come from reducing this range of motion. Okay, whether you need to go ahead and convert, you know, in a in a more rear bias setup, it's totally possible to do that. And then again, like I mentioned, you should be able to have forehand, two hand, all seamlessly happening. And if you need to go ahead and have six or eight handed, like in a sedation situation, you should be able to go ahead and cover that without effort. Also, what's the goal? It's all about flow. And flow is something you know when you see it. So when you go into a practice that is flowing, that has a reduction in stress, you see lack of stress of the staff, you see a sense of organization, people know what's going on in the game plan, you don't have chaos, you don't have go and gets. Uh, that's what flow is all about. Flow is about having fun doing practice. And that's what we're here for. So it's more efficient systems, fast room turnaround, Streamline process, making things happen. So efficient systems, like we talked about in sterilization resupply. Fast room turnaround. The simpler you can make the treatment rooms, the faster they're gonna turn around. And I'll address that in that guide that we talked about before. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Here is an example of streamlining process by actually doing in-room checkout. Uh, again, we won't have time to, to work on the details. We can do that in some of our training. Uh, and we'll address that in the book uh, to a certain extent. But we actually find that 60% of the traffic at the front desk in an office it comes from the hygiene rooms. So if you can do in-room checkout at the hygiene rooms, then you can remove a tremendous amount of the pressure on the, what happens at the front desk. So here's your summary. Make inventory easy. Best in class, just in time. Visual restocking. Fix sterilization. Soak, wash, cook. Empty your drawers and gather your stuff. Have a central resupply area. Not a, some stuff here and some stuff over there and some stuff downstairs and central resupply. You may have paper towels that get stored somewhere else, but have some of that supply in central so you can pull from that. I mean, I'm, that's a compromise that I'd rather not have, but if you have bulky paper, that's okay, but central. Mobilize your specialty procedures. 45 seconds to go. It takes less time to get mobilized than it does for me to tell the patient what we're doing to change up. And then a fabulous four-handed practice is a great two-hand practice as well. If you do those things, you should be able to double or even triple your existing practice without great challenge. But remember, eventually, you need to probably go ahead and expand, and I wanna build the best office in your town for you. Thanks for your time today. I really enjoyed uh, presenting this to you. I hope that you have a, a great and prosperous future. Good day.